And now the story of the man who stole the Suez Canal. Now the Suez Canal, you know, I was really looking forward to going through the Suez Canal on this trip to <laughs> Emu. <laughs> but alas, it's not to be. Because I wanted to follow one of my heroes, which turned out to be the very first person to sail through the canal. Now the canal was open on November 12th, oh, sorry, 17th, 1869. It's 101 miles from the Mediterranean through to the Red Sea. It was opened by um, the ruler of Egypt at the time, Ishmael the Magnificent. And he invited dignitaries from all over the world to see the opening of this magnificent structure, including uh, Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria, who later became famous himself, um, Princess Eugenie from France, um, the Prince of Wales, who later became uh, Edward VII, and the Prince of the Netherlands, plus a lot of other dignitaries who came along to see this incredible opening. Now, the honour, because the French had been so involved in this. They had come up with the concept for the, the Suez Canal. They had done a lot of the, the, um, the design work on the canal and also the construction work on the canal. So because of that, the French were going to be given the honour of the first to sail through the Suez Canal with the royal yacht, the La Agile, or the Eagle. But that was until George Nares came along, aboard HMS Newport. Now, initially the British had opposed the construction of the Suez Canal, uh, and then it wasn't until much later that they bought a 50% stake in the canal. And the night before the, uh, the official opening of the canal, using some magnificent seamanship ability, which he became famous for, with no lights whatsoever, he manoeuvred his way through this armada of ships anchored uh, outside, waiting to go through the next day, until when dawn broke, they found, everyone found that the Newport and George Nares in command was at the front of the line and no one could get past him. So while officially the very first vessel to sail through the, um, the Suez Canal is the La Gille, unofficially the real person who sailed through first was George Nares aboard the Newport. Um, and we'll come to that a little bit later. He had joined the, um, the Royal Navy at the age of 14 and was a midshipman for some time on the Australian station, doing a lot of survey work along that Queensland coast where the Great Barrier Reef is, and got a lot of experience there. And then he was made second mate on the magnificent British battleship HMS Resolute, who for two years went searching for the Lost Franklin Expedition in the Arctic, and I'll be talking about the Franklin Expedition at a later time, so keep that in mind. So he, during that time, he gained a lot of Arctic experience. He served with distinction during the Crimean War, but um, he be, because of his commanding officers realised that he had a magnificent ability with, with um, uh, seamanship ability, but he also had the ability to pass that knowledge on to other people, younger cadets. So he was put in command of HMS Britannia, which was the Naval Cadet Training Centre. And while he was there, he produced the Nares Guide to Seamanship, which um, every cadet, every naval cadet in Britain was issued at the time. They also issued to every Commonwealth Navy. The Nares Guide to Seamanship was issued to the American Navy. It was translated into eight languages. It was always used in the Scandinavian navies, the Russian Navy, and also the German Navy for some time as well. And when I was in the Navy, I used to have a, a first edition copy of it. I don't know what happened to it, unfortunately. Um, but it is the, literally the guide to seamanship, a magnificent book. And a couple of years ago, Lee and I were cruising around on our boat and we went to the city of Harlingen in uh, the Netherlands to see the final, of the, the final race of the tall ships. Uh, actually, it's on again in Amsterdam in August, so we're going to be sailing down there to look at it again. And this is 50 of the most beautiful tall ships in the world who sail into the harbour with all their sails up. Um, they're all crewed by youth from all over the world who uh, pay to go onto these vessels. And it's funny, when you, you see videos of these kids, um, when they, get, they first get on board, they're all nervous and shy. You see them going up into the rigging for the first time, and uh, it's very tentative, very, very scared about doing it. Some people won't even do it. But a month later, you see these same kids scurrying up into the rigging and hurling in these, burling in these sails, um, just standing on a, on a bit of rope you know, shackled to, the, um, to another piece of rope. And uh, they're singing sh sea shanties. They've made friends from all over the world. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. But when these kids uh, sign on, 
they're sent a, a, an equipment list, what they need to bring on the ship with them, and um, you know, clothes and things like that, but also a, a list of what they should read before they come along. And the very first thing on that list is the Nair's Guide to Seamanship. And every one of these ships that we saw uh, has that guide on board as well. He was um, surveying the, the Gulf of um, Suez when the, uh, the canal was due to open. And as I said before, he was the very first person to traverse through the entire length of the Suez Canal. The Ishmael the Magnificent, the ruler of Egypt, and the French protested strongly to the British that this, this was just not good enough. You shouldn't have done this. And publicly, Nares was reprimanded. Privately, he was promoted and given a medal for his efforts. And uh, justly so. And then he was given command of HMS Challenger during the Challenger expedition. Now, this is a half-hour talk in itself. This was one of the greatest scientific voyages of all time. We knew a lot at this time around the, the seas around the coastlines of various countries, but we knew nothing about what was in the deepest parts of the ocean. So the Challenger voyage was to find out more about the, what was there and, uh, and how deep things were. And the reason they pointed Nares was because of his great seamanship ability, but also because of his scientific knowledge. Um, he was, they had uh, 243 men aboard this 225-foot boat, so ship. So it was very, very cramped, mostly with scientists. Now, there was a lot of egos on board, and it was thought the only man that could uh, look after and massage, massage these eagles, egos was George Nares, because of his seamanship ability, because of his scientific knowledge, and also because of his surveying knowledge that he'd, he'd gained. Now, this is a 68,000 nautical mile voyage. I think we're going a long way. Um, and as I said, it's because of his expertise that he was given command. And this was the, the first time that laid the foundations for all hydrographic and oceanographic uh, work. They took soundings throughout the deepest parts of the ocean using 181 miles of Italian hemp rope. And the Challenger became the very first ship, propelled ship, to um, uh, traverse through the Antarctic Ocean. The Nares Deep, which is in the Puerto Rico Trench, the deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean, is named for George Nares, uh, and the, um, the Challenger Deep, which is the, in the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of any ocean in the world, it's up near Guam, is named for the Challenger. And also the Space Shuttle Challenger uh, was named in honour of HMS Challenger, and it's a voyage of exploration. Um, once he'd finished that mission, the Admiral decided to give him a much more arduous mission, and this was to go to take two vessels to the other end of the world to the Arctic. And he took the ship's discovery and alert up as close to the North Pole as he could possibly get. He was the very first person to sail between uh, Greenland and Ellesmere Island, which is now called the Nares Strait, in his honour. And he led a sledging party, which was set a new record for furthest north, or closest to the North Pole, than anyone had ever got before. He returned to England. He was knighted. Uh, he eventually retired as a Vice Admiral. Uh, he died in um, January 5th, 1915 at the age of 83. And he's always been a hero of mine um, because of his uh, work on the Challenger and also because of that Nares Guide to Seamanship uh, and some of the things, he, his two voyages to the Arctic. But um, he's best known around the world as the man who stole the Suez Canal. <laughs>